I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve. Thanks for watching today. We're in a series on Joshua called Rising to the Challenge. You know, Joshua took over from Moses when Moses died. Needless to say, he had big shoes to fill and big fears and obstacles to overcome. You and I can learn much from his faith, especially during these trying times as we deal with the coronavirus and the economic and social problems that it's caused. So grab your Bible and follow along as we learn from Joshua how to rise to the challenge. I'm going to show you a picture of a man, and my guess is that no one is going to know who this is. He's a ship's captain. He became very infamous in January of 2012. Maybe you know him better if we show you the other picture. He's Captain Francesco Scatino, captain of the Costa Concordia. That was the ship that took on water because the captain ran too close to the shore, trying to show off uh, uh, to the Italians on the uh, coast off of Tuscany. He hit some rocks, and the ship took on water and began to sink. Thirty-two people died in that maritime accident. One other person that wasn't part of the, was part of the rescue team, he died trying to save people. The thing that makes this uh, so uh, memorable is that this ship's captain, you know, the, in, in, in maritime world, the captain always goes down with a ship unless you are Francesco Scatino because he got out as soon as he could. There was an uh, audio recording of him talking to the Coast Guard, and he told the Coast Guard, I, I, I fell into a, a lifeboat. And the, the guy said, you need to get back. There are people on the ship. You need to get back on the ship. Well, he never got back on the ship. The New York Post ran this headline, The Chicken <laughs> of the Sea. He got 16 years in prison for what he did. But his negligence that cost people's lives was almost dwarfed by his cowardice. He'll forever be known as the chicken of the sea. None of us in this room, none of us under the sound of my voice, want to be known as a coward. God doesn't want you to be a coward. God wants you to be strong and courageous. Webster defines cowardice this way. It's one who shows disgraceful fear or timidity in the face of danger and difficulty. No one wants to be that person, that man, that woman who's a coward, who shrinks back in fear when the difficulty comes. We want to be people who are strong and courageous. We want to be brave, and we want to be valiant. But the question is, how? How do you do that? Because most of us in this room would think, man, if, if I'm in a situation where it's really scary, I don't know. I don't know what I'd do. I might be like George Costanza in the Seinfeld episode when there was a fire, and I'm pushing everybody out of the way to get out first. I might be like that. I hope I wouldn't be like that, but I might be like that. I like what Eddie Rickenbacker said about courage. He was the American fighter pilot during World War I. He said, courage is doing what you are afraid to do. There can be no courage unless you are scared. George Patton said this, courage is fear holding on a minute longer. Every one of us in this room, we faced fearful things. 
And we're going to face fearful things. And this new school year is going to uh, introduce us to new fears and new challenges and new things that we say, oh, I don't know about this. I'd like to back up. I'd like to go hide. And God is saying, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Now, we're kicking off a new series today on the book of Joshua. Joshua is the book of conquests. In the, in the, uh, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses dies, and the Lord buries Moses. He lets him see the promised land. Moses so wanted to go in the promised land, but he couldn't go in because he had dishonored God, and God said, no, you're not going in. I'll let you see it, but I'm not going to let you enter into it. What you're going to do, Moses, is you're going to pass the mantle of leadership on to Joshua, and Joshua is going to lead the people in. So Joshua is now on the scene. Moses is gone. Here comes Joshua, and Joshua has gigantic shoes to fill. Moses has been the leader for over 40 years. Moses is the one, the Bible says, that God spoke to face to face. Never been a prophet like Moses because the Lord would speak in visions and dreams, but with Moses, he would speak to him face to face. Remember, Moses would go inside the tent, and his face would glow as he talked to God. And you have to follow that guy. You have to be the guy coming behind Moses. Joshua, no doubt, is scared. And the Lord is going to tell him, be strong and courageous. And we can learn through his story how we ourselves can be strong and courageous. Joshua chapter 1, the Scripture says this, Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, that was to the east, and all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great river toward the great sea, toward the setting of the sun, that's the Mediterranean Sea, will be your territory. So he's saying, hey, you see out in the north and the south and the east and the west, this is your territory. He says in verse 5, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Here's the first time. Be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Second time he says it to them. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's the preamble to the book of Joshua, God speaking to Joshua. Three times he tells him, be strong and courageous. When Moses prayed for Joshua and was passing the mantle of leadership onto Joshua, Moses said to him twice, be strong and courageous. At the end of chapter 1 of Joshua chapter 1, the people say to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Six times it's told to Joshua to be strong and courageous. Now, why do you tell someone be strong and courageous? Are they already strong and courageous? If they're already strong and courageous, you're not going to say that to them. You say that to someone who is struggling with being strong and courageous, who is looking at the job assignment and starting to shrink back in fear. Sometimes we look at these guys in the Bible and we think, well, man, I never could be like that. I mean, that guy, uh, David whipped Goliath when he was just a kid. I don't have faith like that. I don't have that kind of courage. I don't have that kind of bravery. But most of the people that God uses, they don't have it. They would come before the Lord, and they'd say like Moses. Moses told the Lord when the Lord called Moses, he said, Lord, you need to send somebody else. I don't have the goods. I'm not, I'm not able to do this. I'm not a good speaker. Remember when he said that to the Lord? I can't speak. I can't lead. I can't do this stuff. 
God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And so Joshua was called, and the Lord said, be strong and courageous. And God tells him how. And in telling Joshua how to be strong and courageous, he's telling you and me how to be strong and courageous. So if you're here and you're thinking, you know, I deal with fears and I'm not very courageous and, um, you know, I hate to say it, but uh, I feel like I'm chicken of the sea. I feel like I'm a coward. Well, God doesn't want you to be that. So how can you be strong and courageous? Three steps that we find in our text. Step number one, believe what God has promised. If you want to be strong and courageous for the Lord and stand up for His Word, His will, His ways, believe what He has promised. Now, what had God promised? He made promises way back when to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, promises about a land that He was going to give him. Abraham, leave your country and your people and go to a land that I will show you. It's the beautiful land. It's the glorious land, it's called in Scripture. It's the land flowing with milk and honey. It's the land of Canaan. It's the land of Israel that God was going to give to Israel. Now, you remember Jacob, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that uh, lineage, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And so, the land of Israel is the land that God promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and then came to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. And that's why we talk about the sons of Israel. The sons of Israel, the children of Israel, are just the descendants of Jacob. And they were going to inherit the land. And God had promised that. Land is really important in the book of Joshua because they're going to go across the Jordan River and they're going to go get the land. Now, remember this. The land is not a vacant piece of property. There are people who live there. There are giants who live there. And when the people had an opportunity with Moses, when they were camped at the south, Kadesh Barnea, they had only left Egypt for about a year and God was leading them into the promised land. They didn't go. Because they said, well, we can't go. There are giants in that land. We need to go back to Egypt. They were so afraid. There were only two of the 12 spies who had faith, Caleb and Joshua. And the Lord said, everyone else is going to die 20 years old and and upward, and you guys are going to march around for 40 years in the desert going nowhere, just marching around in circles till everyone dies, and then I'm going to bring your children into the land. And the only two people that were over 20 that got to go in the land, Joshua and Caleb. But it's the land that God had promised, a great land, and it was theirs for the taking. Look what he says in verse 3. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you just as I spoke to Moses. That's your land. You have to go get it. It's already been given to you, but now you have to go get it. And the people that are there aren't just going to run away from you. You're going to have to fight them. But Joshua, I have promised that you're going to lead the people and you're going to give them the land. Now, what in the Christian life corresponds to the promised land, to this land flowing with milk and honey. Some have said, well, that's heaven. That's what you get when you die. And we have uh, lots of hymns that were written about uh, on Jordan's stormy banks, I, I cast a weary eye, or however that goes. I uh, didn't really sing that one, but uh, some of you have. But, you know, uh, in the sweet by and by, you know, it's, it's kind of like, the, well, that's, that's the land, the promised land is heaven. But the promised land isn't heaven. It's not a picture of heaven. The promised land is a picture of the Spirit-filled life. It's a picture of the life with the Lord where you experience it to the full. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. That's the promised land. It's the abundant life that the Lord wants you to have. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says that God has blessed us already with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. It's already in your bank account, every spiritual blessing. But many of us don't live like we have every spiritual blessing. Why? Because we're not believing that God has done that for us. And we're not living a life of victory because we don't believe His promise. He has given that to us. Now, to live a life of victory and to live a life uh, that is abundant and overflowing, a life 
flowing with milk and honey. That means that you're experiencing love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's the Spirit-filled person is experiencing that inwardly, regardless of what's going on outwardly. Now, in order to have that, there's going to be a fight because the devil doesn't want you to have that. The thief He comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. And the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And he's trying to steal all those things that God wants uh, you to experience, that God has given you, that God says, now you need to claim those things and you need to take those things. And the devil's trying to tell you, no, you don't have those things. You'll never have those things. Uh, He puts a giant in your path and that giant is there to scare you just like Goliath was there to scare the Israelites and to scare David. And the devil does that all the time. And so we deal with giants. We deal with the giant of lust. We deal with the giant of greed. We deal with the giant of insecurity. We deal with the giant of jealousy. We deal with the giant of bitterness. All those things uh, keep popping up, and we have to keep going after those giants to experience the fullness of God. That's what he wants for us. And the key to experiencing that, the abundant life, the key is this. God has promised to us his enduring presence. That's what he has promised. Now, he said to Joshua, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I have been with Moses. I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. So be strong and courageous, because I'm with you. I'm with you. Now, God's presence makes all the difference in the world. And God has promised, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, he's promised to come in. And he says, I'll give you my Holy Spirit, and he will be with you, and he will be in you, and he will be with you forever. He won't leave you. You know, David said in that great psalm, even though I pass through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. God being with you makes all all the difference. Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6 is the New Testament passage that corresponds to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5. The scripture says that this, let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid What shall man do to me? He says, I will never desert you. That means to relax my grip on you, to drop you, to let go of you. Nor will I ever forsake you. That means to abandon you, desert you, leave you behind. God says, I'm never going to do that. And in the Greek, New Testament, Hebrews is written in Greek, there are five negatives in that. God says, I will not, never, never leave you. I will not, never forsake you. It's the emphasis of God saying, you can take this to the bank. I'm going to be with you. And when God is with you, as as the Scripture says, if God is for us, who can be against us? So Joshua's going up. He's going to have to fight giants. He's going to have to go up against warriors. He's going to have to go up against some vicious, ruthless people. He can't do that in and of himself. But he can do that if the Lord is with him. As Jeremiah said, who was facing all kinds of difficulty in his life, he said, the Lord is with me like a dread champion. Nobody messes with the dread champion. Debbie and I had the privilege last week of having Lyndon, our four-year-old granddaughter, spend the night. It's her first time to ever spend the night, or it's two weeks ago, I guess. And uh, Emmy was in... She and Jay went to California to spend some time with Jay's sister, and so Jill was just with Lyndon, and so uh, she was looking for, uh, you know, a a night with no Lyndon, and so she, uh, I mean, I I would be too, and uh, so Lyndon's all over the place, and so she said, Lyndon, you want to spend the night with Gigi and Poppy? And you know, I'm Gigi, you know, that's the way... (laughs) She worked it out. They got that reversed. And so Debbie's poppy, I'm Gigi. And so she spent the night, and she did so well until it got time to go to bed. And then we put her in bed, and uh, she said, I see monsters. I said, we said, no, there are no monsters. I see monsters. 
I said, well, they're not here, so you don't need to worry about monsters. Poppy, I, I, I see monsters. And Gigi, I see monsters. I said, well, Lyndon, what if Gigi stays in bed with you until you go to sleep? She said, that'd be good. And so Gigi stayed in bed with her. And she wasn't afraid of monsters. She didn't thrash about. She just went right to sleep. Why? Because her grandfather was there. And she knew that, hey, if Gigi's with me, I don't need to be afraid. The Lord said to Joshua, I will be with you. And no one will be able to stand before you because I am with you. And the Lord says that same thing to you and to me today. Don't be afraid. You look to me. I will be with you. God promises his enduring presence. So that's the first step. Believe what God has promised. He's promised us a life of victory and abundance. He's promised that he will be with us every step of the way. The way. Second step, obey what God has commanded. So we believe what he has promised, then we obey what he has commanded. Look at verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. God gave commands through Moses to the people. Commands are written in the law of Moses. First five books, that's what the Jews called uh, the law of Moses. And so God, the first five books of the Bible have a lot of commands. Exodus, Leviticus, a lot of commands that they were supposed to follow. And God says, do all that I have commanded you to do. Now remember this, God never gives suggestions to be considered. He gives commands to be obeyed. God didn't give the ten suggestions written on a whiteboard with dry erase markers. He gave the ten commandments etched on tablets of stone written by the finger of God. The commands of God are to be obeyed. There's one response to the commands of God for you and for me, and that is two words, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. The command comes. What are we supposed to do? Yes, Lord. As I was listening to the uh, back and forth between the Coast Guard and Captain Scatino, uh, the captain was saying to the Coast Guard was saying to him, are you defying my order? Are you refusing to do what I'm ordering you to do? And Scatino was saying, no, 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 but I just can't be get back on the ship because of this problem or that problem. You know, he had excuses for everything. Hey, the Lord says that to you and to me. He gives a command, and uh, that's not a suggestion for us to ponder. The Lord's commands aren't like the food at the cafeteria line where you walk through and you, you, know, you see all these different salads and all these different entrees and all these different desserts. Well, you don't get one of everything. Hope not. But... but you just say, well, you know, I mean, they have beets there. I just don't like beets at all. And so I never get beets. And so it's like, I don't want that. I don't want pea salad. I don't want this stuff. I don't want jello. Um, and so people do that with the commands of God. Oh, ah, that's, that's like a beat to me, Lord. I don't want to do that. And, and uh, tithing, no, I'm not going to do that. And, and saving myself from marriage, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. And, and we, we throw all those things out. Hey. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I say? It's a contradiction. How can I be your Lord if you are denying me? So God never gives suggestions to be considered. He only gives commands. And he says, be careful to do according to all which Moses commanded. So here's the question. Are you obeying all that the Lord has commanded? Is there an area of your life where you know you're living in disobedience to God's clear command? How about this one? How about with forgiving someone who hurt you? The Bible is very clear. Jesus said, if you do not forgive men their transgressions, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. So it's a command. You have to forgive. Forgiveness isn't for the other person. It's for you. 
Because if you don't forgive, your heart is going to be filled with bitterness and corruption and rottenness, and it will eat you alive. I talked to a lady not too long ago, and she was telling me about her husband. He's bitter at some things that happened in his life and in the family, and he's just eaten up with it. And he's just angry, and he's just miserable to be around. Yeah, if you get bitter, you'll be miserable to be around. Well, God says you need to forgive. There was a lady uh, some years ago that uh, she was really bitter at another person. And a friend went to her and said to her, said, listen, you need to forgive so-and-so because it's very obvious you're bitter toward him for some things that he has done. And her answer was this, I'll consider it. The commands of God aren't suggestions for you to consider. They're commands to obey. He is God. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And so we need to obey. God said to Joshua, you obey all that Moses has commanded. And remember this as it relates to obedience and disobedience. How does God tell if you really love him? How does God tell if you really trust him? It's in obedience. See, obedience reveals that you love and trust God. If you don't obey God, it's because you don't love him and you don't trust him. And I'm not making that up. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved, uh, he who loves me, shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and you will disclose myself to him. Talk is cheap. You can say all day long you love the Lord, but if you're not obeying the Lord, according to the Lord, you don't love him. Because if you loved him, you would do what he said. If you trusted him, you would follow through and do what he said. I love the story of Peter when he'd been fishing all night and caught nothing, and the Lord begins to teach, and they're throngs of people listening to him. And he says to Peter, after he gets done with his sermon, he said, Peter, cast out your nets into the deep water for a catch. And Peter said, Lord, we've been fishing all night and caught nothing. Lord, this isn't the time. Night time's the time to fish. This isn't the time to fish. The fish aren't biting. Now, I know a lot more about fishing than you do. I mean, I know that you're the Lord and you're a great preacher, but I'm a good fisherman. I've been doing this a lot longer than you have. Uh, now, he doesn't say all that, but you know that's going on in his mind. And it was a big deal. Casting out your nets is not like throwing out a line. I mean, it's a big deal. That's a huge net. And so that's a major deal to cast out the net. So he said, Lord, we've been fishing all night and caught nothing. But at your bidding... I'll do it. I'll do it. And he did it. And you remember the story? He caught so many fish that the nets began to break, and he was putting them into the boat, and the boat began to sink. And he said to the Lord, he saw that Jesus was the Holy One of God, and he saw his own sinfulness, and he said, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. I'm a sinful man. Here's the thing that you need to remember that I need to remember. It's a little progression, and it goes like this. To know God is to love God. And to love God is to trust God. And to trust God is to obey God, and to obey God is to be blessed. To know God is to love God. To love God is to trust God. To trust God is to obey God, and to obey God is to be blessed. Jesus said, if you know these things, you're blessed if you do them, if you do them. The blessing is not in the knowing, although you have to know to do, but the blessing is in the doing, in the doing of the Word of God. And when you do what God tells you to do, He blesses you for it. So the very first step, you want to be a person who's strong and courageous for the Lord, you believe what God has promised. Secondly, you obey what God has commanded. And thirdly, you study what God has written. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. Verse 8 says this, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have 
success. Joshua, you need to study the book of the law. You need to study day and night. You need to meditate on it day and night. It needs to be in your mouth. Why? Because the Word of God is food for your soul. That's why. And Joshua, I want you to be strong and courageous. And one of the key ways that you can be strong to know that I'm with you, to obey what I say, and to feed on my words. Jeremiah said this, your words were found and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I've been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah the prophet, Lord, your words were found, and I ate them, I fed off of them, I nourished myself with your word. Now, God's word in the New Testament, Matthew 4, 4, is likened to bread, because Jesus said to the serpent, uh, to, to the devil who came to tempt him, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So it's likened to bread. It's likened to milk, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. So it's bread, it's milk. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14 calls it meat. It says that meat is for the mature. He said you can't just live off of milk. Milk is for babes, but solid food, meat, is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. God's Word. It's bread and milk and meat. It's food for your soul. Now, some of us are not very strong. Why? Spiritually speaking. Why? Because we're not eating. You come to church once a month, maybe, once every six months. You're not spending any time in the Word of God. The only time you hear the Word of God is when you come to church, uh, hit and miss. And you, you say, well, I don't have any spiritual strength. Yeah, because you had not eaten in, in six weeks. And you're not going to be very strong if you don't eat in six weeks. Now, one of the strongest guys who has ever lived is a guy who was in the bodybuilding industry in the early 2000s. He was a competitor. His name was Ronnie Coleman. I have a picture of Ronnie Coleman. It's like looking in the mirror. Uh, <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Ronnie Coleman, he was eight times Mr. Olympia, eight years in a row. He's 5'11 when he was competing, 300 pounds. He had a 60-inch chest, a 36-inch waist, 24-inch biceps, 36-inch thighs, 7% body fat. I don't have anything in common with those numbers. <laughs> He could bench press 500 pounds five times. He curled 325 pounds. His squat was almost 900 pounds, and he deadlifted 900 pounds. His diet, he ate 5,562 calories a day. Okay, I do that. <laughs> This is the distribution, 546 grams of protein per day. That's a lot of protein. 474 carbs, 150 grams of fat. Hey, how, how do you get to be 5'11", 300 with 7% body fat? I mean, I can get to be 5'11", well, 5'10", 300, but uh, I, I, there wouldn't be 7 per, maybe 70% body fat. I mean, we know how to do that. But 7% body fat, you have to be eating and working out like crazy. And he was eating and eating and eating and eating protein. He was eating the milk and the bread and the meat. God says, that's what you need to do with my word so that you can be strong. His word is food for your soul. And God's word is to be in your heart and in your mouth. The psalmist said, Lord, your word I have hidden in my heart, I've treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's there in my heart. And he says to Joshua, you, you shall meditate on it day and night. The book shall not depart from your mouth, 
but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. To meditate on it. That word meditate means to mutter. It means to moan. It, it, it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're studying something and you're like, hmm, hmm. You know, you just kind of make little, little groans and little mutters about it. That's, God wants us to do that with His Word where we read it. And you're not just trying to sprint through a book of the Bible, but you're really spending time meditating on what does God say. Let me give you something that I had just learned a few years ago. I never thought about it before. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He, 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 he. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you are with me. He's not talking he anymore. He's talking you, Lord. He, he changes it. At first, he's just telling people about the Lord. Now he's talking to the Lord because he's in a dangerous spot. And Lord, I need you to be so close because he is with me. You are with me, Lord. And he directs it directly to God. Hey, those are little things that you don't get from a cursory reading. That You get that from meditating on it. Now, we have a, an object lesson in nature, and that's the cow. You know, cows have four stomachs. Some of you know that. Some of you that are into farming, you know that cows have four stomachs. The rest of us didn't know that. But we do know this, that cows, they chew up the grass and then they, they swallow it, and it goes in one of those four stomachs, and then they spit it back up again, and they chew on it some more. Did you know a cow, on average, chews its cud? We call that cud, where it goes down and then it comes back up. Most people call it vomit, but they don't in, in the cow world. It's called cud, and it's chewing their cud. That's what they do, and uh, they do it for eight hours a day where they chew the cud. I saw a video. Oh, that contemplated. Uh, bringing it out here. It's just a cow. He's just, that's all he's doing, just chewing the cud. That's what they do for eight hours. They have a horrible life. I mean, they really do. Right? That's a different sermon. But anyway, so that's a picture of what we're supposed to be doing with the Word of God. See, we have it down in our heart so we can spit it back up, so we can put it into our mind and put it into our mouth, and we can speak it, and we can think on it, and we can say, what does this mean? And we can pray it. See, you know, a lot of us have trouble praying. How do you pray? pray praying uh, is integrated with the Word. As you read the Word, you pray that back to God. You say, Lord, you said this. Lord, I'm facing some difficult times. You said that you would be with Joshua, and you said in Hebrews that you would be with me. And Lord, I'm facing some, some difficult, dangerous, scary things, and God, I'm just going to claim your presence. Isaiah 26.3 says that God will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him because he trusts in him. And when you're facing uh, some difficult, difficult times where the peace is not there, you claim Psalm 26.3. You uh, take it out of your heart. You put it in your mouth and say, Lord, you promised that if I would put my mind on you, you would give me peace. And that's what I do right now. You put God's Word into practice. It's in your mind. It's in your mouth. You speak it over your life. You speak it over your kids. Don't speak all the fears. Speak the Word of God. Speak the truth of God. And all these things, it says in Romans 8, 37, we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. You know, the devil likes to beat us over the head with a big club of guilt saying, look what you did here, and look what you did there, and you've come to church, and boy, if people knew what you did, like I know what you did, I know what you did last week, I know what you did last month, I know what you did last summer, and he beats you up over the head with guilt. What does the Lord say in his word concerning his children? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have been forgiven, and we have been set free. I told somebody the other day, they said, oh, I just, I just struggle so much with, with my past, the things that I did, and I asked God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me for the same sin over and over and over and over again. I said, listen, you need to ask God to forgive you once and thank him a thousand times for forgiving you. Yeah. Study what God has written. Obey what God has commanded. Believe what God has has promised. Then you'll have success. Then you'll make your way sure. 
Then you'll be prosperous, and you'll be strong and courageous. Let me close with this story. I ran across this story this week. In the 16th century, there was a Protestant reformer in England. His name was Hugh Latimer. He was known as a great preacher of his day, and as a result, he had many opportunities to speak. And on one occasion, he was to speak before Henry VIII, King Henry VIII of England. He thought about this great responsibility to bring a message before the king, and he realized that the message that God put on his heart wasn't going to be received well by the king. Here's how he began his message. Latimer, Latimer, do you remember that you are speaking before the high and mighty King Henry VIII, who has power to command you to be sent to prison and who can have your head cut off if it pleases him? Will you not take care to say nothing that will offend royal ears? And then he paused, and he said these words, Latimer, Latimer, do you not remember that you are speaking before the King of kings and Lord of lords? Before him at whose throne Henry VIII will stand, before him to whom one day you will have to give an account of yourself, Latimer, Latimer, be faithful to your master and declare all of God's word. That's courage. That's courage. God says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Do you want to rise to the challenge? It starts by giving your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're watching and you know about Jesus, but you don't really know him. Today's the day for you. Pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, I ask you to come into my life, to forgive me of my sins, to be my Lord and my Savior, and I surrender all to you. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.